Good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you're watching. This is Mike Krupa from southwestern Poland, uh, hosting another great roundtable discussion with our esteemed guest this evening, or this afternoon, this morning. From the United States, we have with us Scott Ritter, who needs no introduction. Scott has been a frequent guest of our show, and we're very happy to see him back. And the one, the only, Ray McGovern, former CIA analyst of 27 years, who began his CIA career all the way back in the JFK years. He served under several directors and presidents. Also in the 1980s, he prepared the so-called PDB's presidential daily briefs. He's an all-around man of the Renaissance, so to say, American patriot, and just a walking encyclopedia on so many issues that are very crucial in terms of the current geopolitical situation and international relations. Uh, you can get all the links to Scott's website and his Twitter, as well as Ray's website and Ray's Twitter in our description box. Also, we have first time today uh, an attendance list, which we will be gathering emails so we can create our Votem TV community. We encourage you to click that and subscribe. Gentlemen, we are witnessing currently tumultuous times. Uh, you both have seen uh, events of an epochal nature, especially during the time of the Cold War. Uh, Ray, you were around during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, you saw the Berlin Crisis. You both witnessed the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Persian Gulf War. I'm getting the impression, though, that what we've seen in the last few weeks in terms of the coming together of China and Russia are things that are, are, are phenomena that somehow even supersede what we saw during the Cold War. So situations and events that'll have ramifications for many, many years to come and for much longer possibly than the Cold War. So I wanna begin with Ray. Ray, would you agree that the realignment between China and Russia, which we're witnessing almost on a daily basis, uh, is even bigger than those epochal events that both of you witnessed during the Cold War and after? Well, it's very hard, Mike, uh, to weigh uh, which is more uh, critical, which is more liminal, which is more tectonic. After all, there are a lot of tectonic events. But you know, you're onto something. This is big, all capital, B-I-G. Uh, it's been coming. Uh, Russia and China, after very serious difficulties just 50, 60 years ago, are now joined at the hip. There's a virtual military alliance between them. And this has incredible ramifications for what the US does in Ukraine, or what the US, US tries to do in the South China Sea or the Taiwan Straits. Now, I have a little background in this. <laughs> I can imagine. In, 19, in 1963, my first portfolio was Sino-Soviet relations, right? The relationship between Moscow and Beijing, we called it Peking at the time in deference to Chiang Kai-shek, okay? But it was real. They were shooting at each other across the border, for God's sake. China was, was, was claiming, it had iridenta. It was claiming half of Siberia that was actually, truly seized by some Russian Cossacks in the 17th century, okay? Like half of Siberia. So there was all a matter of rivalry, including for leadership of the international communist movement. We thought they hated each other. We were right then. We thought they would always hate each other. We were wrong then. We did leave ourselves it out as intelligence analysts do. And we said, well, now if more enlightened leadership comes into power in Beijing and in Moscow, uh, this eternal hostility may, may term, turn out to be terminal hostility. They have, of course, ample reason to join together now because there's a single enemy, and that's the U.S. We used to describe the relationship, here's China, right, and here's Russia. It was a triang triangular relationship about equilateral, if you remember your geometry. Now the long sides of this triangle have made it isosceles and who's on the short end of thing? <laughs> U.S. is on the short end of thing. The problem is that these benighted, effete, elite people educated at the very best schools don't realize what's happening and don't realize the implications. The head of national intelligence said, 
just a couple months ago. You know, China is really interesting. They they're playing both both sides of them against the middle. You know, they don't want us fully support Russia. They don't want. Oh, give me a give me a break. Anyhow, to finish up here, these last three days in Moscow with Xi Jinping there in secret talks. I mean, we don't know much about those five hours that Xi and Vladimir spent together. And that's by design because they are they are getting together on contingency plans about what happens in another month or two when Russian forces make it clear that Ukraine has lost the war. What's the U.S. going to do at that point? And what are China and Russia going to do together at that point, depending on what the U.S. chooses to do? Scott, your take? Well, see, I, I don't come at it with the, quite the history that Ray does. I'm, I'm still not, I'm not a gray beard yet. So um, I, I have to defer to Ray to the, uh, to the, to the <laughs> I, I'll speak to it uh, from the standpoint of a young whippersnapper um, who is familiar with history. Um, I, I liken to what we're seeing is the fall of Rome. Um, see, I, I don't, I don't think there's a, a triangle. I don't think there's an isosceles triangle. I don't, I think there's Russia and China. And America's over here, and the, the, the ship's done left, and we don't realize. Uh, we 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 didn't realize that we're supposed to have jumped on that ship to join those people to work cooperatively cooperatively with them to manage their union. That was our task. Our task wasn't to try and split China and Russia up. Our task was to manage the union to make sure that when they come down at the table, there's a seat over there that says the United States. And that we're invited to sit down and work with them on how we're going to do this thing called global economics. Um, but we don't play the economic game. We play the bully game. See, economics is business. Business is when I sit down with you and we sit down, we come up with a contract. We say what our joint objectives are, how we're going to work together, share profits. And it's all agreed in advance. So we move forward as problems come up. We hold meetings and we fix these problems. That's not how America works. America sits down at the table and says, you will do what we want to do or we'll sanction you. And what we saw the last three days was China saying, we don't play the sanction game anymore. We don't care. You don't matter. Literally, China just said, you don't matter. The only person that matters anymore is Russia. And we are with Russia against you because you have defined yourself as our enemy. We did not define you as our enemy. You defined yourself as our enemy. This is a choice that America made. America is the only but person to blame here. There's a lot of people out there saying, well, if Russia hadn't done this or if China hadn't done that, no, I'm sorry. Um, it's all America's fault. And the thing is, we don't even realize it yet. Listen to Tony Blinken. I mean, this could be, it, under any other circumstance, he could be auditioning for a Monty Python skit because he is so far removed from reality when he speaks about China and the world. The same thing with John Kirby. I've never seen a man so lost in, in, in the space. He doesn't know what to say. We still have people that say, oh, China went to the Middle East and, and Saudi Arabia and Iran. Isn't that cute? No, guys, what they did is they just wiped you off the Middle East plane board. I mean, we may have, um, you know, the fifth fleet still in Bahrain, but it isn't there to secure Saudi Arabia anymore. Uh, that mission is gone. Saudi Arabia doesn't care. Saudi Arabia's picked the other team. They, they, they used to have Team America on their shirt. That shirt's gone. They got Team China on their shirt right now. That's the direction they're heading. That's the direction almost the entire world's heading. And I will make the following prediction. Europe, as it starts to wake up to how awful we have been, how awful. Now, maybe the Poles haven't quite woken up to that because they're still uh, infected with some sort of uh, resurrection of the uh, miracle of the Vistula, where somehow the, the uh, heavens are going to open up and the angels are going to come down on horses and the poles are going to be right out and take western yeah, the, 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 the hussars scott the hussars yeah, the hussars you know so yeah. they're there okay well so the poles are still snorting whatever they're snorting but the rest of europe <laughs> is sitting there going this sucks we our economy is shot literally shot and it's not even the worst yet at least the germans are starting to wake up and they're going whoa we dodged a bullet this year with this mild winter but next winter it doesn't matter what the temperatures are we're out of gas. We're out of everything. We got nothing. So they're already telling their citizens, hey, tighten your belts for next winter. That's not a good sign. And that's especially not a good sign when industries are shutting down 
their doors because they can't afford to stay open. Europe's going to wake up one day and go, this relationship with America has been the worst thing in the world. And let's look over at Russia, who has a growing economy now, um, <laughs> despite everything we've done. I forget which foreign minister was, Denmark or somebody just came out and said, yeah, we're not even considering another round of sanctions against Russia because it just doesn't work. Nothing they've done work. It just backfires. It's literally at some point in time, you got to realize that when you're trying to hit Russia over the head, but all you're doing is rebound and back, smacking in the face. When you got both black guys with broken nose and all your teeth are missing, maybe you don't try and hit Russia on the head with the hammer anymore because it's not working. Nothing's working. Europe's going to pivot to China. That's my prediction. In the next decade, you're going to see Europe say, enough with America. We're pivoting to China because that's their only hope. There's only one player in the world today with, that has the global economic reach capable of doing all this, and that's China. And they've now made alliance with Russia. They have done that which we have said we never want to happen. <laughs> Go back to Nixon goes to China. The whole idea was to split the two apart. And yet we've screwed that relation up every step of the way. We've never respected the Chinese for who they are and what they are. We only want the Chinese to be our whipping boy, our little poodle, to do what we told, our little trick dog. And the Chinese went, nah, we, we've done grown up. We ain't living in your basement. We're out in the world. Not only that, mom and dad, our paycheck's bigger than yours. Um, and that's the reality, that we're looking at the fall of Rome. America is Rome, and it is falling. The fall of Rome didn't happen overnight. It was a process. But let me just be very straight about this. The American empire is dead. It, we're just waiting for the body to fall. Scott, you touched upon Richard Nixon. Now, Richard Nixon was a very prolific writer up until his death in, uh, it was in April 1994. We're coming up on the anniversary soon. Um, Ray, you had some intimate dealings with the Nixon administration in terms of the, uh, the treaty that was signed to Soviets in 72. I mean, looking at the trajectory of American politics right now, you know, the people who claim to be an elite in foreign policy circles. I have to ask you the question that's written on a coffee mug I have downstairs. I'm not drinking from it now, but it, it, the question is, I mean, what would Nixon do? I mean, he forged a relationship with China that was strategic in the sense that it had its internal logic. What do you think would be Nixon's reaction today if you were around seeing that, you know, the American Secretary of State is calling off a, a meeting with the Chinese due to a, a weather balloon flying over the United States? Well, I have to start off by saying, Mike, that uh, Richard Nixon is not my favorite president. <laughs> that said, uh, his strategic outreach to China was one of these liminal, one of these tectonic shifts in the world balance of power. Now, I mentioned my experience with the Sino-Soviet conflict and reporting on it, being the responsible uh, analyst for that. We told Kissinger, we told him that the, the Russians hated the Chinese and the Chinese reciprocated to the extent that they blocked the provision of military aid through China to Vietnam, for God's sake. I mean, they're all socialists, common, you know, they all have these common aim. There's only one communist regime engaged against the arch imperialist America, that's Vietnam. And rather than facilitate more arms aid to Vietnam, the Chinese were hating the Russians so much, they backed up all that aid at the border. They canceled flights from Vladivostok down to, to, to North Vietnam. So that was just one measure of, of the antipathy there. Now, I, I mentioned to you that that we mentioned in, in this uh, series of, of articles for Kissinger, that uh, it's not going to be forever, probably. Uh, they hate each other, maybe forever, but uh, it was already starting to see signs of more reasonable outlook on the part of Zhou Enlai and others, okay? And so we said, if this responsible leadership comes in, and by sending Kissinger to Beijing in 1971, you have made the Russians very, very worried. What are they worried about? They're worried about this triangular thing. They're worried that the Chinese are going to steal a march in improving relationships with you in Washington. The Russians are going to move. They're going to be more pliable. Now, 
Well, we right. Well, we got a really nice commendation from from Kissinger. That's the first time that our views tended to coincide with Kissinger's. <laughs> so we took great great relish of that. Anyhow, uh, what happens? The Russians show that they're pliable, they're flexible enough to come to an agreement on access to Berlin, for God's sake. Four power agreement concluded during this time after Nixon visits his Beijing four power agreement. And then they asked us, that is Nixon and Kissinger, do you think the Russians really want arms control? And this is very close to Scott's heart, I know. And uh, we said, you yeah, know, we think they, they do. Um, I think they see mutual benefit in tamping down the arms race. But we also think that they're more flexible now because they don't want the Chinese to steal a march in relationships with the U.S. Whoa. Do we see flexibility in the SALT, the strategic arms limitation talks? Yeah, yeah, we're seeing more flexibility there. Looks like we can have a deal if we want it. The deal's drafted, and then Kissinger comes to us and says, hey, are the Soviets going to cheat? And we said, don't know, probably. How, how soon can you tell us? <laughs> Again, this is Scott's bailiwick, inspections, right? Doverai, no proverai, okay? Uh, trust, but verify. Yeah, we could verify. We probably we went back to the guys who run the satellites and all the technical stuff to get us up there. And they said, well, I, we're pretty sure we could. We could tell if they cheated about uh, about a week or so, 10 days. So we went back to Kissinger and we said, well, we can assure you. Are you absolutely sure? No, we're not absolutely sure, but maybe 90%. That's enough. Okay? That was enough. We could, we could, vi <laughs> we could verify and they could trust. That was the first, that was a pivotal arms control agreement up until the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that, that Scott worked on and implemented. Uh, that kept the peace for three decades, 30 years, count them, okay? It wasn't real nice to have this balance of terror, but it was a balance, okay? So what am I saying here? I'm saying that that if Nixon were around over the last couple of years, I don't think, you know, he didn't go to these, he didn't go to Yale or Harvard or one of the Princeton or all the, I mean, he was just a, he was a smart guy and he had a smart guy working for him. Don't really think highly of Kissinger either, but he was smart, right? They saw they could exploit this. Now we have a bunch of well-heeled uh, elite people who did go to the best schools, mm -hmm. the same schools that the best and the brightest written about on Vietnam were, were responsible for 3 million, million Vietnamese being killed, 58,000 American troops. So the best and the brightest is not where you want to go for this. You want some somebody who knows about realpolitik and somebody that doesn't really threaten a two-front war without the ability to even fight one front. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But Putin has said some very significant things about why the U.S. would be taking on China as well as uh, Russia. <laughs> Well, I think we need more politicians then from poor lemon ranches, at least poor before, before they find uh, oil on them, as uh, as Richard Nixon used to say. Uh, Scott, you were around in the latter part of the uh, Cold War, but I think even during your time when you had the negotiations leading up to the INF Treaty, I mean, you have George Shultz. I mean, we just have a new biography coming out, very praiseworthy of the way he conducted himself in foreign policy. Um, I'm pretty sure you're seeing the same difference between people who are grounded in real politics, or at least a larger amount of these people during the Cold War than the, you know, literally the stuff that we have to deal with today uh, in D.C., which I'm pretty sure if that realist mindset was still around in Washington, that triangle that Ray alluded to at the beginning of our discussion would have been definitely more equal. Your thoughts? You know, when I look at people like Tony Blinken, um, and I have to just be straight up. Um, I don't like him. I don't respect him. I have no use for the man whatsoever. Um, it's it's an embarrassment what he's doing. Uh, Jake Sullivan, zero qualifications for the job whatsoever. He's a communications specialist. He's not a national security specialist. Uh, he's a man who does propaganda for Hillary Clinton. He shouldn't be anywhere near the White House, anywhere near the um you know, we're, we're uh, balance of power. To say. And then we got Joe Biden who's been literally wrong on everything. I, 
you know, it's been out there on the internet. Everybody should be familiar with the 1997 presentation that Biden made to the Atlantic Council, where he mocks the Russians. He mocks them for saying, if you guys don't make good with us, we may go to the Chinese. And he says, well, tell me how your senior year went. <laughs> I'm Joe Biden. I'm so clever. And he said, and what? You're, then you're going to go to the Iranians. Hey, Joe. Um, <laughs> yeah. And senior year was pretty good. I mean, these guys had a great spring vacation. They graduated. They all got great jobs and you're unemployed. Um, figuratively speaking, look, we've always had idiots though, advising presidents. Um, I mean, look, the, the, the fact of matters is, and, and I, and I share Ray's um, mixed feelings about Henry Kissinger. Um, I think the man is evil personified. I think a lot of the people that came out of, um, out of the elite schools uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War had a, a sense of uh, entitlement um, that allowed them to do things in the name of the greater good, regardless of the cost. And that was you know, Kissinger's mindset. He's doing it for the greater good. Of course, the greater good is America, you know, the manifest, the, the nation that has been touched by God. Uh, that's what manifest destiny is. We've been touched by God to do God's work. Um, and these people did it and they believed in it. Um, you know, but at least... Kissinger did some smart things as, you know, again, he, he, he was evil, but at least he was intelligent. He knew the world. You can say what you want about Henry Kissinger, but to say that he was ignorant of world affairs, ignorant of history, you can't say that. Then we can take, for instance, Jimmy Carter. Who did he surround himself with? It's a big Niv Brzezinski. One of the, again, I mean, not picking on Poland, man, but the last thing you want. No, you can pick on him. No worries, Scott. Go ahead. Communist <laughs> Communist <laughs> Phil, advising a president at a time when we needed to be working with the Soviets to overcome obstacles. He's the one who created Afghanistan. Ray talked about the negotiated the strategic arms limitation talks, and they were good talks. Um, but there were I mean, it was a limitation. It was it was putting a cap on growth. It wasn't reduction. And why was it limitation, not reduction? Just what Ray said about arms control. Uh, because they wouldn't allow on-site inspections, and therefore the best you can hope for is a modicum of uh, of, of, of verification. Uh, satellites are only so good. In 1984, 82, 84, uh, the CIA was asked about on-site inspections, and they said, uh, no, we're not ready for those yet. They said, well, what do you need for to make satellites as good as inspections? And they put out their requirements. It's a very classified document at the time. fact is, one of the most sensitive documents out there because it gave away what we didn't know. But at that point in time, they said, we need X, Y, and Z. And to this day, we're still trying to get some of those satellites capable of doing what they what they said because it's almost impossible. It was okay. Ray, you remember the SS-16, uh, the, 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 the road mobile sure. missile that salt sure. is going to go away with? Well, the Soviets weren't supposed to produce it. We found out they were. We found out they were cheating. We found out they had a couple regiments of SS-16s in Plisetsk. But that's okay because we detected it, we were aware of it, and we moved on. Uh, the CIA did a good job, or NRO, or whatever they called themselves back then, um, did, a, did a good job. But now we needed to have on-site inspectors. So Brzezinski got us into Afghanistan. I don't think people understand that. It wasn't that the Soviets invaded on their own volition. The Soviets were provoked into going to Afghanistan because of there's a big Niv Brzezinski's uh, uh, effort to bring up the Mujahideen, to rise up this Islamic unrest. So um, shame on him. Then, so, you know, Jimmy Carter is the guy who started with the stupid people. You know, Kissinger was just evil. Carter is the guy that started with the stupid people. Then we get Ronald Reagan, you know, Reagan and Ronnie. Uh, Mr. SDI. I had a chance to get rid of all nuclear weapons, but couldn't do it because he needed Star Wars. But that's okay. He was advised by people like Richard Pearl. Um, again, one of the dumbest men on the planet about anything. Everybody keeps saying Richard Pearl's smart. He's not smart. Richard Pearl was against arms control. Uh, Richard Pearl believed we could win a nuclear war. Richard Pearl was stupid. Um, and fortunately, Ronald Reagan, in the second half of his career, of his ten tenure, uh, went to Richard Pearl and said, you're stupid. Get out of here. And uh, we're doing the INF Treaty because Ronald Reagan had an epiphany. I think it happened when he got shot and he was in bed and he realized I'm mortal and world could come to an end. And then while he was there recovering, ABC played this thing called The Day After, a movie. And he watched the movie and he went, whoa, that's about nuclear war. And he turned to his guys and said, is, this, is it is it that going to be that bad? And they went, 
yeah, that's made for TV, man. That's good. <laughs> it would be so much worse than what that is. This is supposed to be TV, so people have to have hope. You can't show what they what reality would be. And he went, well, we can't have that. That's insane. And that's why he did the INF Treaty. And that's why he sat down with Gorbachev and said, we have to reduce. And that requires on-site inspectors. And that's where yours truly came in. And other people who are far more qualified than me came in and did, and did that job. But then we didn't learn our lesson. I and mean, here's a chance. That was the opportunity for smart people to rally around the president. And I think Ronald Reagan had a team at the end. James Baker, good people, smart people, intelligent people, making the right call. And then George Herbert Walker Bush comes in. And, you know, George Herbert Walker Bush just didn't believe the, the lessons of Ronald Reagan. George Herbert Walker Bush was still in the Cold War. He didn't trust the Soviets. He didn't trust Gorbachev. He dragged his feet. He allowed perestroika to collapse. And at the end result is we fumbled that football. We lost the Soviet Union. And then Bill Clinton came in and literally surrounded himself with the dumbest people in the world, the worst <laughs> advisors in the world. We mismanaged the Soviet problem like you wouldn't believe. And this created, and we mismanaged China. Bill Clinton mismanaged the world. He didn't do anything right, nothing. I mean, I know him personally because of what he did in Iraq, but I also know him sort of directly because I was involved in the, in the Russia problem. But I also see what he did with Europe, and I see what he did with China. He was the one of the worst foreign policy presidents in the history of the United States. And then he turned it over to the worst foreign policy president in the history of the United States, George W. Bush, who surrounded himself with all the losers that Ronald Reagan fired. And these people come in and the world. We had presidents who have been Barack Obama surround himself with idiots. Donald Trump brought back even you know John Bolton. Mike Pompeo, you got to be kidding me. And now we got Joe Biden. It's not the quality of the education. It's the fact that America can't produce leaders anymore. Our academic institutions are so filled with ideology. That's the last place you want ideology is in an academic institution. An academic institution should about free thinking. I don't care if somebody wants to write a paper that Vladimir Putin is, you know, should be sainted. Please make that argument. Make the argument. You're in college to learn. You're not here to be indoctrinated. I want you to say this, that, and then we challenge you. We talk about it. And maybe at the end you go, maybe he shouldn't be sainted. Or you convince us all that it should be Saint Vladimir. Whatever. That's the process. But now you come to university and your professors say, you have to do this. They build a box. And your thoughts have to be in this box. And God forbid your box comes out of this. Your thought comes out of this. You'll be failed. You're not allowed to think. You're not allowed to explore. You can say what you want about the 60s. I wasn't an adult then. Ray, you know, you were free love, marijuana, whatever they were doing. <laughs> but, uh, but they were thinking. They put on their thinking caps. They were thinking back then. The conclusions that they came to, you might not agree with, but at least there was a process. Today, you go to university, especially an elite one, Georgetown, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, and you come out and your 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 degree is going to be what they say your degree is going to be. And your diploma is going to be what they say it's going to be. And if you go into an advanced degree, your thesis is going to be what they say it's going to be. You're not allowed to challenge the system anymore. The moment you challenge the system, you are called a not only a dissenter, but you're a traitor. You've sold out to the enemy. You're a shill, whatever. And then you're done. You can't get a job. In order to get that job, get into corporate America, get in the government, you've got to play the game. That's why, and I'll leave it with this, that's why I deride all the people that advise the presidents today as Putin whisperers, fakes. You know, they're, they're, they're like the people who claim to be horse whisperers. You know, I can calm a horse down by whispering in its ear. Horse is calm now. It's magic. Okay, they're the Putin whisperers. You're worried about Russia? Putin, 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 Putin. And oh my God, it solved everything. Putin did everything. Yeah, they're idiots. They're morons. They know nothing about Russia. They know nothing about Putin, but they all went to the same kind of institutions and they all got the same degrees. Authoritarian dictatorship. That's it. They don't think, they don't know Russia, nothing. Stupid people doing stupid things. I apologize for going on for too long. Ray. No. <laughs> Hallelujah. That, that, that's the truth. I think uh, I think it was Peter Hitchens who recently said that at contemporary Western universities, and this pertains to Russia, I think uh, in a huge degree, they don't teach you uh, how to think. They teach you what to think. 
So there's, you know, this, this impression at the very beginning that we already know that Vladimir Putin is evil and the rest are just details, but that you have to accept that barrier in order to, you know, advance in Russian studies or so on. It's the same situation in Poland. Uh, there's no debate about it. I mean, if you're the heretic who says, wait a minute, I think we should think this through. It's like, oh, you're a Putin stooge. You're dangerous. I think we should think about relegating you and basically canceling you. But going back to uh, the China-Russia issue, just one more question on this uh rapprochement because there's a lot of cynics out there and they're present in Polish, Western American media who say, yeah, you know, the Russians and the Chinese are getting together. Sure. They have to do it, flex their muscles. They're going to be stronger together. But at the end of the day, we know this is a sort of, uh, if you're familiar with Tom Clancy's writing, the bear and the dragon scenario where Putin is at the end of the day, the junior partner to Xi Jinping. And he knows it. He's suffering under the weight of the great leader. Um, so, all we have to do is sort of wait it out. We'll make a deal with Xi Jinping and Putin will suffer at the end of the day because he knows he's the junior partner. Ray, what do you have to say to that? Well, uh, the Germans would say that's quatsch. Uh, the Russians have a different word for it. Um, you know, if you think about this tectonic shift um, and you think about how ignorant these these well-heeled effete advisors to Biden are concerned. Uh, when Biden on the spur of the moment during a conversation with Putin said, let's get together, you know, this Ukraine thing is worrying me. Let's, uh, you know, let, let's get together. I like one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And so they agreed to meet on June 16th in Geneva. That was 2001, okay? Yeah. Now, what, what did, what happened there? We only know really from what Biden said, getting on the plane or actually the post conference and then getting on the plane. He said, you know, it's not, uh, it's not proper for me to, to say what I told uh, Mr. Putin, but, but China is being squeezed. I mean, Russia is being squeezed by China. Uh, they have this thousand miles border, um, they have this really bad history. Uh, Russia knows that China is going to be a supreme international power, the, the biggest and, and better than Russia. Uh, Putin has got this real problem. Uh, he's, he's being squeezed by China. Now, <laughs> these guys, Blinken and Nod and Sullivan, they were reading textbooks from Five decades ago, when I was writing that prose, talking about the Sino-Soviet split, split, which was real then, okay? I guess they didn't get any updates. It's going to happen the last two, two decades, but they're way off the mark. As I mentioned, I think it was January or December, the head of national intelligence, what's her name, April Haynes, said, the Chinese are playing a really clever game. You know, it's a, they're playing both sides against the middle. Well, that's not the case, April. And you're missing the big implications here because this is really, this is really tectonic. Now, I mentioned that, that uh, Putin himself was asked. Um, actually, it was at Valdai, this discussion club that they have in Russia on the 27th of October. Uh, one of the Q and A's in the three and a half hour <laughs> Q and A, uh, one of the questions was, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, how do you how do you look at the uh, Washington's desire to take on China as well as taking on us in Ukraine with providing arms and all? What do you think's going on there? And Putin scratches his head and he says, you know, it doesn't seem to be much logic to it, does there? Uh, I think they're just crazy. Sumashechi, Russian word for s s out of, um, your mind. Go, she's, go. I think they're going out of their mind. Okay. Then he says, I thought there was a subtle reason behind this, and I, I thought about it for a long time, but I don't, I, I don't think there is. I think that it's just a function of arrogance and a feeling of impunity period end quote now i think putin thinks that is right i think also for what it's worth that it's right but it doesn't matter what mcgovern thinks it matters what putin and g think 
Now, I think during those five hours of one-on-one, -on -one, pretty much, with a translator, just this past couple of days, they were figuring out what, how they're going to react to Washington when it ups the ante one more time or maybe two more times in Ukraine. What are they going to do? What's she going to do to support Putin if he, he goes all the way up to the Dnieper and farther west, okay? Well, if the Americans react as these idiot, these idiots, uh, these uh, what crazy people do when they when they feel they're back against the wall and with a political year coming up, election year, well, Putin and Xi cannot be sure what these guys are going to do. If they're crazy in their view, in mine. And so that's really a labile, uh, really a precarious situation internationally. They have to plan for the, for the worst. Now, let me add this because it's, I think it's relevant. I mean, I was an army intelligence officer, but that was 157 years ago, okay? Uh, but I know the first thing you do is you look at a map, right? And you figure out how many enemy forces there are how they're equipped, and then you do locks. Uh, not the locks that you, you eat bagels in, in the Bronx. No, no, you, you do lines of communication and supply, for God's sake, you know? Now, the benighted generals that had been leading our armed forces didn't know about the mountains in Afghanistan, okay? They didn't know about the desert or the, the plain area, the... the, the, the uh, the area in Ukraine between the Dnieper and where Russian forces are now, uh, they, you know, they didn't plan on it. They didn't plan on reinforcements. They didn't plan on lines of communication and supply. So anyhow, the basics, these guys didn't even look at. The generals who I think get, get promoted by the degree of, uh, of obsequiousness they show. So what I'm saying here is this, that not only tactically on the ground and uh, Scott knows this far better than I, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, do the Russians have a supreme advantage? But strategically, for the first time since I've been watching them, and that's six decades, the Russians have an edge in strategic arms. They have these, some, some of you my age remember how big it was that something could fly at Mach. Oh, God, that's the speed of sound, for God's sake. Oh, Mach 2? Oh, these hypersonic missiles fly at between Mach 5 and Mach 9, okay? Nine times the speed of sound. Is there a defense against them? No. When did the Russians start building them? When we gave them the back of our hand. When we gave them the back of our hand and leaving the ABM Treaty and threatening to leave the INF Treaty, which, in fact, we did, okay? Now... They have that advantage now. I'm not, well, I'm sure that the the intelligence officers in the Pentagon realize that whether they're, whether they're courageous enough to tell uh, Defense Secretary Austin that, that's another question. Uh, he has a reputation of falsifying intelligence information. When he was head of CENTCOM in Tampa, ruling over the Middle East, 51 of his intelligence analysts complained formally to the Pentagon IG that Austin and his top crew there were falsifying the intelligence on Syria and on Al Qaeda and everything else. So so they're telling these benighted, uh, well-heeled people what they want to hear. And that's really danger. And that's why if they're looked on as crazy, uh, the Soviet military, <laughs> Russian military, will be telling Putin, look, Vladimir Vladimirovich, just remember, we not only have a tactical advantage, but for the first time, we can get through the defenses with impunity. Now, I know you don't want to do that because that's a real risk, but we can do that. And it's the first time we can do that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Scott. Scott, jump in. No, I mean, the, the real problem right now is that not only have the Russians, again, it's just a total self-inflicted room. I just want to remind people that um, when when the United States pulled out of the ABM Treaty, um, we're the ones that started deploying anti-ballistic missile defenses in in violation of the uh, of the treaty. Uh, Russia hasn't hasn't violated the treaty. They've built some really good anti uh, anti-missile defenses, but they're not in violation of the treaty. 
<laughs> so uh, Russia is still complied. <clears throat> uh, the INF Treaty. We're the ones that violated the INF Treaty. We withdrew from it. You know that missile that everybody said the 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 seven M seven two nine. I don't know whatever the number was. Um, and, and the U.S. is like, that's in violation. That's why we're leaving. Well, we knew it was a lie. I knew it was a lie. I mean, I, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Ray understands it. In the intelligence business, um, it's like brain surgery. Once you've learned the brain, you know, and you've learned <laughs> the brain and, and you can take the top of the skull off and you look at the brain, if you know it, you know it. All right, you might get cooler tools to come in, but it doesn't change the reality that the brain is the brain. And you've got to do certain things when you're doing brain surgery. You might have great, cool tools, but it comes down. The guy that knows the brain is going to fix the brain. Intelligence is the same thing. It ain't no secret, ladies and gentlemen. Really, everybody's like, ooh, intelligence. You either listen to their damn conversations or you don't. Okay, that's called SIGINT. You either take photographs of their stuff or you don't. That's called imagery intelligence. You either have a spy on the inside who's giving you a document or you don't. That's called human intelligence. You know, you can you can do other little variations of that theme, but that's it. That's it. There's nothing really, you know, awe-inspiring about it. It's a really basic trade. So a missile takes off. <laughs> you know, okay, first of all, missiles built someplace in a design bureau. All right. We know how design bureaus work. We know how they communicate. We know that. And we collect on that. Uh, we The missiles take it to a test facility. We know how to collect on that. The missiles launched. We know how to collect on that. It's been done before. It's brain surgery. So now people are trying to say that something happened. And somebody like me goes, no, it's not what you guys are saying. You're misreading the intelligence. It's really basic how you're misreading. The Design Bureau produces several kinds of missiles, one of which is a caliber missile of the range permitted because it's a range prohibited by an F-treat, but it's launched from a ship or the air. But if they do launch it from something, a ground site uh, that's permitted under the treaty, um, you can't classify it as designed for ground launch. That's what happened. We misread a caliber missile test as this other test. And when the, so when the Russians came in and said, guys, you're getting this all wrong. Here's the missile. There it is. You know, somebody might le like me looks at the photograph and goes, same booster as this other missile. Um, and, and the key thing about a booster is if it's the same booster, it's sort of the same max potential range. Got it? So if this booster is on a missile that is permitted by the treaty, that means it can't go the range. Now it has a guidance section and a warhead. But on the new missile that we've accused of violating the treaty, there's a bigger guidance section. Basic physics, ladies and gentlemen, bigger guidance section weighs more. And if it weighs more, that booster ain't going to go as far. And the warhead, bigger warhead, weighs more. So you combine a bigger warhead, bigger guidance section on the same booster, and you're trying to tell me that that violates the treaty when the other missile doesn't. We're insane. We are literally insane. You can't make this stuff up. We wanted out of that treaty, so we told lies about the treaty. But now you know what? Look at all the missiles that are hitting Ukraine today. Not a single one of them is being launched on the ground at intermediate range. Not a single one. Everything that's going from the ground to the ground is within the permitted range of the INF Treaty, meaning it's below the 300 mile or 300 and some odd mile threshold. Uh, the Russians didn't build this new missile, deploy it, and use it. Believe me. If they want to hit sites in, 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 inside, uh, in, inside Ukraine and they had this miracle intermediate weapon, they'd use it. They'd use it because there's no treaty prohibiting it. But the Russians aren't violating the treaty. They still aren't. Wow. To imagine having people that honest with that much integrity. I'm not saying, look, we, I, Ray, I told you, they cheated on the SS-16. You know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. But the Russians haven't cheated. The Russians are playing the game fair. The Russians are doing what they're supposed to do. We're the ones that are violating everything. We're the ones that represent the greatest threat to international peace and security. And the Chinese have finally broken the code. There was a period of time, and, and Ray, correct me if I'm wrong. February 2021, when Putin met with Xi Jinping in, in uh, Beijing at the head of the Be Beijing Olympics. If Joe Biden had traveled to Beijing, would that have changed the dynamic of that meeting? And I think the answer is yes. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Had, had Joe Biden simply said, I'm flying to Beijing, 
and I want to sit down because I want to demand time from Xi Jinping, and I'm going to bring with me some some uh, economic proposals, and I'm going to bring with me some stuff that maybe uh, makes him feel good about Taiwan. Now, why would I want to do that? Because I had quality people surrounding me saying, Joe, see that guy, Vladimir Putin? He's trying to get buddy-buddy with this guy, Xi Jinping. We don't want that to happen. We need you to go to China, and we need you to muddy the waters, buddy. I mean, it does, you don't have to sign a final treaty, but I need you to sit down next to Xi Jinping, get your picture taken with him, become pen pals with him, whatever it takes. We need him when he wakes up in the morning to say, I wonder what Joe Biden's thinking today. I wonder what Joe Biden's going to do today. But we didn't do that. We opted out. Vladimir Putin came in. And Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping have been making pancakes together on birthday. They're friends. <laughs> They're friends. They like each other. So it's not like he's going, oh, my God, here comes that guy. He's like, Putin, come on over. Yeah, don't worry. Joe didn't show up. So we're just going to have a party ourselves. 5,000-word joint statement about redefining the world order. Sure, why not? Because America sucks. And that's the reality. America sucks. Joe Biden missed a golden opportunity to muddy the water. And we've been fumbling ever since. Because China knows that there's an inherent risk doing what it's doing with Russia. China understands that that's not the natural course of direction, that this is something that's being compelled by outside powers. But China has been given no other option, none. There's no off-ramp. There's no plan B, plan C. There's only plan A, which is to go to Russia. And what happened the last three days? China just said, we're all in. They're not holding any chips back. They're not going, eh, I don't know, man. Yeah. Maybe something's going to happen here. Maybe they're going to, you know, somebody's going to pull an inside straight. I don't know. China just went, screw it. Bam, all in, all chips on the table. Russia, America, you're out of the game. And it's a game changer. It's literally the fall of Rome. I fully agree. As a matter of fact, when we talked about the elites in the States during the Cold War and how they assessed the situation, how the people were of a much different caliber than they are today, it's interesting because we had the same situation in the Polish People's Republic at the time, because if you recall, the back channel diplomacy between the states and China leading up to the meeting uh, with the leaders of Nixon China happened in Warsaw. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So our, you know, uh, foreign policy school at the time was a completely different show than what it is today, basically subordinate to the United States State Department and possibly the American Enterprise Institute. So it, we're seeing the same methodology and the same sequences also in Poland, unfortunately. But um, going back to Russia and it stands towards NATO because uh, there was some recent reporting uh, in consortium news, and this is related to some of the uh, um, documents that have been declassified from the British side recently. And this is being used uh, for the many pro-NATO advocates as proof that, you know, Russia wasn't really against NATO from the beginning, because as these documents show, Boris Yeltsin said, I have nothing against NATO expansion as long as we do it slowly and you take our interests into account. Well, at the same time, in those same documents, we have statements from former Premier Chernobyl Mirden, who told John Major that, you know, you got to take it easy with this NATO expansion. You have to understand who Boris Yeltsin is, because this could basically become an explosive situation in the future. So he was basically echoing what, uh, you know, George Kennan would write in that famous op-ed in 98, or in the uh, the interview with, uh, what's his name, Thomas Friedman on the New York Times. Uh, but a lot of people are coming out and saying, no, 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 there was discussion about NATO expansion. Russia, you can say they were against it from the beginning. Uh, Ray, uh, what's your take to such line of argumentation? Are we to take them at their word that indeed there was such a big division in Russia that there was a big enough segment of the Russian uh, political class that wanted, that had nothing against NATO expansion, that it was only Putin who created this, you know, uh, this argument to use against the West, which in essence, in their view, is a fake argument. When Yeltsin took power, the oligarchs rubbed their hands. The oligarchs in Russia, the oligarchs in Ukraine, the oligarchs in America. The Wall Street boys came in big time. They plundered the Russian economy. Why? Partly because Yeltsin was a drunk. He had this mega, mega millennium. <laughs> He had these great big thoughts about how he was going to he was going to prevail with the slippery guys like Bill Clinton. Okay, now to his credit, uh, Yeltsin realized that when push came to shove, would win the next election for him, which we did. I mean, 
There's a picture of Time magazine with Yeltsin on there. He's got an American flag. He's got all this money. That the, and the, the headline says, we did it for Yeltsin. He's got four more years or something like that. So that's Yeltsin. A drunk. There, there were hangers on and there were oligarchs. But people like Putin were watching this and saying, my God, this guy is frittering away our heritage. Oh, my God, th- th- this is really going to be t- detrimental to our whole homeland. Now, it was a miracle that Putin ended up being appointed by Yeltsin. There are various stories as to how that came about, but he was, and that's when it changed. That's when Putin reached out initially to the West, but then saw the door was closed, and he developed these things. And when the ABM Treaty was was left, as I say, uh, as as Scott has said, uh, the Russians didn't leave it right away. They asked, why did you do this? And we, they were told, forget about it. It's none of your, it's none of your damn business. Okay? Ooh, Ray almost said a bad word. <laughs> yeah. And, and, That's allowed. It's and, allowed. No worries. And this, the same thing. <laughs> The same thing with the uh, the INF treaty. Why? Why do? You, what? What plan do you have here? Oh, don't eat their business. Okay. So, what am I saying here? Scott has really set the stage really nicely uh, about how this all played out with respect to the ABMs not being prohibited anymore, and so we put little emplacements, capsules in Romania and in Poland that were for ostensibly. ABMs, but as everyone knew, they were in the wrong place for. <laughs> they'd have a, they'd have a prayer of hitting a, a a Russian ICBM, and so the the Americans say, oh, oh no no it's it, it's against Iran. We're trying to save we're trying to save Europe from from Iran, and then people say, well yeah, but Iran's not even working on a nuclear warhead as we know as we learned first in. 2007 and, and still is uh, well that's okay they might they might develop but yeah you know, so it was it was transparently fraudulent from the beginning these were not abm sites these were sites for the precisely the same kind of missiles that got that Khrushchev tried to put in cuba medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles now why do i say that well putin has railed uh, has criticized this uh, specifically. Now, let me take you back to December 21, 2021. He gets up before his admirals and his generals, and he says, all right, the Americans have this kind of launcher. It be, can be converted to accommodate cruise missiles, Tomahawk missiles, <laughs> Tomahawk missiles, okay? And if that happens, the relatively slow moving, it gives me seven to 10 minutes launch to target time. Now they're working on hypersonic missiles, the ones we already have. They'll get them eventually. That gives me five minutes, five minutes to to decide whether to, he doesn't say it this way, but whether to destroy the rest of the world. Okay, so then he looks at these admirals and generals and he says, so this time, we need something on paper. We need a we need a signed document. Now I'm looking at these generals and admirals, and they're going, Vladimir Vladimirovich, wasn't the ABM treaty a signed document? Wasn't the INF treaty a, a sign? Give us a break, Vladimir. That was the 21st of December. Nine days later. White House gets a call from the Kremlin. Mr. Putin wants to talk to Mr. Biden right away. Now, they, they were flummoxed. They said, wait a second, our, our negotiators are meeting in Geneva on strategic weaponry and other, other matters uh, on the 9th and 10th of January. Why does he have to talk to him now? Please, he needs to talk to him now. Now, to his credit, Joe Biden accommodated and he received the call. What was the, what was the, the play, what was the outcome of this? Uh, the out, the readout, as they say these days. Uh, quote, Mr. Biden said that Washington has no intention of putting offensive strike missiles in Ukraine, period, end quote. 
Wow. So they're suspected of going in Poland and Romania, but Biden is telling Putin, no, we don't have any intention of, wow. The negotiations off to a great straight, great start. Uh, Ushakov, the main advisor to Putin at that time, that says, uh, you know, New Year's Eve will never be so good. They celebrated. And then when they got to Geneva, the U.S. side forgot about it. <laughs> they woke up Biden on New Year's Eve and said, Joe, Joe, you didn't really say that, did you? Well, you know, I thought it'd be a good way to get the negotiate. Joe, forget about it. So they forgot about it. The 12th of February, about what, uh, six weeks later, the last conversation between Biden and Putin, read out the, the, the promise or the undertaking that the U.S. has no intention of putting offensive strike missiles in Ukraine was not discussed. It was off the table. Okay. Now, why is this important? That's the 12th of February last year, right? Okay, I mean, no, 12th of February, two weeks before the invasion. Uh, what happened before that? As Scott mentioned, Putin was up talking to his best friend Xi Jinping in, in, in Beijing to open the Winter Olympics. Now, there was an incredible document signed, as, as Scott has already mentioned, but also, in my view, the discussion went this way. Putin, uh, best friend Xi, uh, I'm afraid uh, that the Americans are not being candid with us. They made this undertaking about intermediate or, or offensive strike missiles. And they arrayed their troops to take over Donbass. These are troops trained in secret pretty much for the last 10, for the last eight years and they're NATO equipped and NATO ready uh they're gonna they're gonna force our hand in the donbass the the nazis are still pretty much influential in here i think i'm gonna have to invade ukraine like pretty soon reaction from xi jinping you mean after the olympics are over right oh yeah yeah after the olympics, <laughs> the olympics are over the 22nd of february the 23rd both Donetsk and Lugansk are recognized by Russia as independent countries. They ask for help on the 24th, the invasion. Now, I'm not sure that's the way it went down, but I think, I still think that Putin would not have done that had he not had Xi's nihil upstart, or at least Xi saying, okay, if you have to do it. And this violated the core Chinese principle, for God's sake, of non interference and others' affairs, sovereignty, this whole thing. In other words, Xi gave Putin a waiver on Westphalia and supported him from the outset. So all this benighted thinking, oh, China's playing both ends against the middle. Oh, China's been very careful. No, oh, no, no. China's joined at the hip with, with Russia now. And that's the overweening, that's the overriding reality in the new strategic equation, what the old Soviets used to call the, uh, the correlation of forces internationally, the correlation of forces has changed against the U.S. just a matter of time before not the ruble becomes rubble, but that the dollar becomes rubble. So, Scott, it would seem that NATO expansion was uh, a topic of opposition, at least among sober-minded Russians in the 90s, and that uh, Yeltsin wasn't the voice of sanity that represented the real public opinion or the uh, the Siloviki, the people who were actually in power in Russia and who were determined to keep the Russian state intact. Let's just remember that <clears throat> Boris Yeltsin was, I mean, if you go back and look at his rise to power during the Soviet times, you know, uh, Mr. Moscow mayor, um, you know, popular guy. But then uh, when, when Gorbachev did his revolution, you know, the uh, the 19th All-Party Union Conference in June of 1988. Um, Yeltsin was not a player. Uh, Yeltsin got in a fight with Ligachev, the number two guy in the Communist Party, stormed up to the stage, embarrassed Gorbachev, got in a debating match with uh, Ligachev, and was basically ousted, kicked off the Politburo. Uh, they were trying to kick him out of the party, but he wouldn't quit. Uh, but he was thrown away he was supposed to disappear that's what you happens and 
when you mess with the Communist Party, you disappear. But then there were these elections, and of course, Yeltsin won the uh, the deputy spot, but he wanted to get on the Supreme Soviet because then he could be in a position to be on the, the, the big ruling group. Um, well, he didn't have the votes for it, but I mean, he did, but they, Gorbachev was playing the game. You know, no, nope, you're not going to get in. Some dude from Siberia who got on there and said, I'm going to give up my seat for Yeltsin. I'm going to let Yeltsin sit in on the, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the thing. And, and it happened. Yeltsin's now on the Supreme Soviet, and then Yeltsin becomes a player. And then as things fall apart, Yeltsin outlaws the Communist Party in Russia, and then he becomes the head of, uh, of Russia, the president of Russia. But he doesn't know what he's doing. He's just sitting there playing stupid games. Because remember, Russia was pretty much managed by the Soviet Union, by Soviet power. And then what Putin or what Yeltsin's saying is, no, 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 Russia manages itself. So he tried to assume all this stuff. And there was just this mess going on. It was just sloppy. Anybody who thinks that Boris Yeltsin was an effective leader, an effective manager, he wasn't. One of the reasons why Perestroika failed is because of Boris Yeltsin sabotaging everything that Gorbachev was trying to do. That's all Yeltsin did. He's a drunk. He's an alcoholic. He embarrassed himself in front of the Americans. He'd fly to America expecting audiences in the White House. And they're saying, you ain't the head of state. You know, you, you don't get to come in and meet the president, but we'll take you on a nice tour of, uh, you know, American drinking establishments. He'd fall down drunk <laughs> in Ireland. Um, and then he becomes the head of, of, of Russia. And what's one of the first things that happens? You know, this is 1992. October 93, he has tanks firing main tank rounds into the parliament. He's at war with the parliament. Yeltsin ain't a Democrat, guys. He's a dictator. He's the worst kind of dictator. He's a drunk dictator. How did Yeltsin stay in power? Because the drunk dictator was agreeing to everything the United States told him to do and everything the oligarchs yep. wanted him to do. That's it. Mm -hmm. He was just Mr. Incompetent. And so now... You know, so now he has sold his soul. So Yeltsin's job is to say yes to whatever they want to do. And so someone comes up and goes, hey, Boris, baby, <laughs> have a sip of vodka, buddy. Dobre Utra, comrade. Um, how's that vodka taste? Good? Want another one? Hey, NATO. Not bad, right? Oh, no, no. NATO good. NATO good. Yeah, yeah. NATO good. He's not coordinating with anybody. He's not the head of anything. He's got his little circle of people around him who are robbing the country blind, enriching themselves. And he's just this corpulent, fat, drunk idiot sitting there <laughs> embarrassing himself. But even when he sobered up and he had a moment of clarity, and you saw it, they've released the transcripts of Boris Yeltsin talking to Bill Clinton. And even in, in, in a moment of clarity, say, uh, Bill, my friend, uh, uh, <laughs> Bill, my friend, uh, this NATO expansion, not a, you're going to bomb Serbia. That's not a good idea, Bill, my friend. And Bill, his friend, went, yeah, hey, Boris, have another sip, buddy. Uh, yeah, we're going to bomb Serbia. Uh, NATO expansion, yeah, we're going to do that too. Uh, friendship, yeah, I like you, pal, but it's America. Hey, hey Boris thinks we're his friend. <laughs> and, uh, and all that. You know who was listening to all that, especially near the end? A guy named Vladimir Putin was in the room watching America humiliate Russia and watching Yeltsin cave into America. And everybody else is in the room doing the same. The people that aren't making money, the people who care about the power, you know, people denigrate the KGB or the FSB back then. Well, for the most part, there were some corrupt guys. Don't get me wrong. Everybody's corrupt. For the most part, they were patriots who sat there and went, we're not happy about any of this. And so when Putin finally gets becomes president, I call him the accidental president. He was picked in the end because Yeltsin had a moment of clarity and he looked around him and there was nothing but he realized he was on his way out. He couldn't govern anymore. Totally <clears throat> and he looked around and he said, I'm surrounded by wolves. Even my family members are wolves. Nobody's on my side. Nobody's on team Yeltsin anymore. They're waiting for Yeltsin to go and they're going to come in and they're going to carve everything up. And oh my God, I, what have I done? What have I done? He even said that in his final speech. What have I done? I have made many mistakes. He finally realized it. And the only person in his inner circle who wasn't there with the knife coming out is a guy named Vladimir Putin. He went to Putin and said, I want you to be president. Putin went, no, <laughs> I don't want to be president. It's not the job I want. I'm not ready for it. And he went, yeah, but that's why you're going to be it, because all these people around here, they want the job and none of them are ready for it. So Putin came in and the first thing he did is he purged. He purged. He said, 
and he brought in the people he trusts. They're like, he brought in the KGB. Well, they were the only ones who weren't taking bribes at the time. They were the ones that he could trust. He needed people that weren't taking money, who weren't in bed with the oligarchs because he went to war against the oligarchs. The first thing he told the oligarchs is, okay, you get to continue to make money until I figure out how we can share the wealth, but don't get involved in politics. Politics is my game. And who's that one guy, Komogortsov or whatever his name is, thought he was Mr. Yukos? You know, he's like, hey, I'm going to make billions of dollars on this. And Putin, you're an idiot. You're a putz. You're going to be out of here. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to do what? I'm under arrest. You just took Yukos away from me. You dissolved Yukos. I'm going to jail. Yeah, that's what you do when you mess with a guy who actually cares about his country. And Vladimir Putin, and I, you know, I'm not going to say here for all his faults, because I don't find too many faults with the man who resurrected Russia from the Seth pool that Yeltsin created into what it is today. I'm not going to find too many faults in that guy. And if I'm a Russian, I think he's the best thing that happened to Russia ever. He saved Russia. If it weren't for him, if the wolves had come in on Yeltsin, Russia wouldn't exist today as it currently exists. Because the goal of the United States wasn't just to expand NATO. Why are we expanding NATO? Because we want to weaken Russia. We want to collapse Russia. Everybody talks about the Chechen wars. Oh, those Russians, and they, what they did with the Chechens. They never talk about what we were doing with the Chechens. Why we were doing it with the Chechens. Why were we supporting the Chechens? Why were you giving them money? Why were we facilitating the transfer of Wahhabist ideology and outside actors into it? Because we wanted the Chechens to break away from Russia. And if that happened, you begin a process where the other autonomous republics start to break away and then Russia dissolves. And now we have, instead of one big Russian federation, we have a whole bunch of little pieces that we can better manage, better control, because that's what it was all about controlling Russia so that we could destroy them politically and exploit them economically. And the one guy that said no, his name is Vladimir Putin, and we had been at war with that man ever since because we can't stand the fact that a Russian patriot stood up for Russia, defended Russia, and actually helped Russia succeed. Gentlemen, we're going for an hour. I want to throw in at least two or three more questions. Thank you for your time, by the way. But, um, Scott, you mentioned Chechnya in the late 90s. If I recall... I mean, I was a squirt then, but I did my history uh, reading towards my PhD uh, dissertation. There was a committee for a free caucuses, I believe, running around in Washington, which is basically a who's who's list of all the other people who would, you know, a few years later promote the uh, Iraq liberation project and so on. So the crystals. So we know what was going on there. Bob Gates in his memoirs, if I'm not mistaken, mentions the fact that Dick Cheney, I think it was in 89 or 90, was, you know, talking openly about, well, not openly, not in public, but in the White House at meetings about breaking Russia up. It's out there. You're getting this from Bob Gates. And uh, Ray, if I'm not mistaken, I think you work, or Bob Gates actually worked for you for some time. So that plan was out there for sure. Um, and why you, it, have it, to, why, why you have to mention that, Mike? Well, okay. I mean, well, uh, I, did, I didn't train him real good. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it was the latter. I tried to pin him down. I told him he was too ambitious. <laughs> but you know, he was he was really clever and he wormed his way up to the top and became my boss after a while. So no, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you got no, that's right. all right. No, how how, how life works. <laughs> but uh yeah, it's it's you're seeing the same people and going back to Yeltsin in those documents that were revealed from the UK side, there's an interesting account of how Yeltsin is talking with Polish president Lech Walesa, and Valenza tells him, you know, we're thinking about joining NATO. Uh, we want to get your view on this, or we're announcing it to you, rather. And Yeltsin says, yeah, that's fine with me. And even Lech Valenza was shocked. I mean, oh, really, you have no objection? No, we're good. Valenza apparently relayed that to his British counterparts later, and they were even shocked that, wait a minute, we were expecting a totally different Russian response. So you had the expectation that the natural Russian response was not to have a military bloc moving towards uh, Russia's borders. So I completely agree with you gents, that uh, Yeltsin was the exception, not the rule. And the exception basically came down to the clear bottle of Beluga, unfortunately, or anything else he was drinking, if it was vodka. Um, going back to uh, some of the people involved with the Caucasus, Iraq, and now Russia. Because if you look at the 90s, you look at 2003, and you look at the situation now, even though some people like Max Boot have come out and said, you know, I was wrong in 2003 to believe that we can impose democracy on other countries. Yeah, that's sort of an admission, but I'll still be in the establishment, still be talking for money with CNN. I'll keep all the perks. Um, I remember this gentleman. He was a congressman from North Carolina. Uh, 
His name was uh, Representative Walter Jones. Representative Walter Jones in 2003 voted to invade Iraq. But after a few years, he came around to the conclusion that he was completely wrong. And he actually wrote letters, I think, to every single family of an American serviceman that died in Iraq. So he took uh, redemption seriously. And there was an interesting situation. He actually wrote me a personal uh, message on Twitter. I think it was about 2018. I commented something on his profile. And he said, you're right. And we just established a dialogue where I said, you know, I admire what you do. But uh, atonement for what you've done would at least be shown in that way, in the sense that, you know, you write to the American servicemen. You go to the VA hospital to help out with the people you sent to war. I think that was a very honorable thing for him to do. But the same people who promoted breaking up Russia in the 90s, the same people who promoted uh, Iraq in 2003 are the exact same people that are promoting uh, the entire Russia stupidity in Ukraine today. The exact same people, literally. Um, and we're seeing it on the outside and on the inside. And I'm wondering, you both have experience with intelligence. I mean, was the generational shift from 2003 till today for the worse or for the better? Because I'm not seeing any differences. The same mistakes, the same unsubstantiated claims. Ray, what went wrong? No one was held accountable. They falsified the evidence. They fixed the evidence around the policy. It's written down in a briefing that was given to the Prime Minister of England, uh, Tony Blair, after he met with uh, George Tenet, the head of the CIA at the time, 20, 20 July 2000 and two, two okay so he went to washington and he, tenet was told him told to tell him the truth dear love great great word dear love uh, dr dear love briefs tony blair and he says look the decision has been made for war uh, the war will be justified by the conjunction of weapons of mass destruction and uh, and terrorism. In other words, we're going to say that Saddam Hussein has been cavorting with terrorists and that he's likely to give them weapons of mass destruction. That's in the minutes of this meeting, 23 July uh, 2002. So there's no doubt the intelligence establishment uh, actually after a five-year study by the Senate Intelligence Committee a bipartisan result said, and actually uh, Senator Rockefeller paraphrased this. He said the evidence used to justify the attack on Iraq was unsubstantiated, contradicted, or even non-existent, period, end quote. Now, what does non-existent intelligence look like? I mean, like you, you, you manufacture it, right? Scott Ritter did everything he, a human being could possibly do to get it to see Joe Biden, to get past Tony Blinken, who was his uh, chief of staff at the time, to see his own senator. Her name was, what was it, Clinton something. Yeah, Hillary Clinton. He couldn't get to first base. He gave interesting information to Newsweek. They buried it, and so did everyone else, and we had the war. So has to have things improved? Well, who was the other participant in this in this uh, fraud? It was the mainstream media, Times, Washington Post. The op-ed director of the Washington Post at the time was a fellow named Fred Hyatt. Ninety percent of the op-eds in those days were to say, hey, "What weapons are best to strike? Weapons are best. We gotta we gotta stop this. We gotta have a war." Okay, now. Three years after the war, when it became clear there were no weapons of mass destruction, Fred Hyatt was up at the Columbia School of Journalism. Pretty sober bunch. And they said, uh, Mr. Hyatt, uh, you, you kept saying weapons of mass destruction as, as if flat fact that they were in Iraq. And you said that for months before the invasion. How do you explain that? And Hyatt looked at them and he said, and this is a quote. Well, if there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, we probably shouldn't have said that there were, period, end quote. Now, Robert Perry, 
who I learned a lot about journalism from, was with me when I heard that. And he said, Ray, he says, you know, if I recall correctly, that's one of the cardinal principles of journalism. Uh, if something's not so, you're not supposed to write that, that it is so, right? <laughs> Hello? So what, what happened to Hyatt? Well, this is sort of microcosm. What happened to Hyatt? He was fired, right? Forget about it. <laughs> he stayed in his job 20 more years until he died a year or so ago. 20 more years in that spot where he forged all this information about the war. So what's the situation now? The press is even worse. I mean, uh, the Post and the Times make no secret of uh, repeating blather from inside sources. Some of them say CIA or intelligence sources. And the press and, and the, the sources themselves are crazy. You know, we have a fellow named William Burns. He's the head of CIA now, okay? He's supposed to tell the president the truth. Now, does Bill Burns know the truth about whether uh, the attack on Ukraine was unprovoked? Well, he's a pretty smart guy, and I'm sure he remembers that Sergei Lavrov, the new foreign minister back in 2008, called Bill Burns in and said, Mr. Burns, do you know what NIET means? <laughs> yeah, NET means NET, no Ukrainian entrance into NATO. If you allow that or promote it, we are going to have to decide what we'll do when there's a civil war, would we have to invade Ukraine? Okay, so NET means NET. Of course, three months, two months later, NATO approved membership for Ukraine as well as for Georgia. Now, what's my point here? My point is, how the, <laughs> how the hell can... Uh, can Bill Burns now say the propaganda line? Ah, uh, this well, this uh, this invasion, incursion, this special military operation by the Russians was unprovoked. Now, one of the reasons I I tried to to show that it was not true that it's unprovoked. In other words, it was provoked. Picks up from your mention of membership in NATO. Now. There was no scintilla of evidence that it ever entered into Putin's mind or even Yeltsin's mind for that matter, although his mind was shot, uh, that, uh, that Russia needed to take back Crimea from Ukraine until the coup in Kiev that the West orchestrated that we know is the most blatant coup in history because we have intercepts showing, showing it. Uh, on the 22nd of February, 2014. Now, my point is this, a month later, a month after, actually two months later, a month after uh, the referendum, which was approved by the Crimean people to rejoin Russia, uh, Putin made a big speech. She was sort of missed in the press. And this is the other, this is the other media analysis that really helps. Uh, he said this, he said, yes, we had to annex Crimea. Uh, possible membership for Ukraine in NATO was just part of the problem. Even more important was the notion that offensive strike missiles would be put in Ukraine. No, I'm sorry, would be put in Crimea. Okay. So even more important. Now, as the years went by, the Ukrainian army was trained up to NATO standards and uh, uh, and the ability to put these Tomagok missiles or hypersonic missiles became real when these holes were put already in Poland and Romania. Now, you know, let me just give you a layman's perspective here. I asked some of these experts, uh, Ted Postal, for example. I said, Ted, um, I mean, how they get, how are they going to get these Tomahawk missiles in there, for God's sake? Uh, it's hypersonic. How are they going to do that without being detected? And Postal says, well, Ray, I'm a physicist, and maybe I know some stuff you don't know. Uh, but it gets dark at night in Poland and in Romania and in Ukraine. And it just takes a couple hours to put those missiles in those same holes, which are perfect to accommodate them. I said, yeah, but you need a hook and ladder. You know, we have observed them. Ray, no, no, trust me. 
All you need is an electric line truck, for God's sake, that the kind when you're, you're when the storm blows your lines down. Yeah. You, that's all you need. Three hours, and then you put a little new disk in to reprogram your computer, or you just do it electronically, and you've got offensive strike missiles that can hit Moscow now between seven and ten minutes, and hypersonics five minutes. So it's not a problem, okay? They can do it. Uh, Putin knows they could do it better than we do, but I can assure you that he's right about that. So all I'm saying here is that this is the kind of threat that President Kennedy faced back in 1962. You made reference to that before. Offensive strike missiles minutes away from Washington, from Omaha, where SACA Strategic Air Command was, uh, in Cuba. It was the same thing. Now, Khrushchev looked at that and saw Kennedy's reaction. They were talking at that time for what it was. He, Kennedy would say, look, Nikita, this is an existential threat to my country. It's not a ploy for me. You better take them out. Khrushchev talks to his, to his folks and says, my God, you know, I have nothing ventured, nothing gained. It's not an existential threat to us. So let's pull these damn things back before, before the U.S. blows up the, the world, okay? So I'm saying here, yeah, that's what I'm saying, okay? That Khrushchev was smart enough to realize that you don't mess with existential threats to another nuclear power. Now, is Biden smart enough to realize or his advisors smart enough to realize that you don't foster, arm, equip, encourage an existential threat against a nuclear armed nation like Russia, okay? I don't know. That's why they are appropriately called crazy, not only by McGovern, but by Putin himself. Scott, I imagine you concur. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it, Ray's 100% correct. Um, you know, the. But we talk about uh, timelines, though. I mean, it's um, you know the, the 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 deception. You know, when I joined the military, I was uh, I was as naive as the day is long. Um, I was a child of the Cold War. I was a true believer. Um, my father was you know career Air Force officer. I was raised uh, on the front lines of the Cold War in Turkey in the 1970s. I mean, where my school mates, you know, their fathers were spies. Uh, <laughs> doing the real thing against the real target. Uh, then we moved to Germany, uh, West Germany, and literally you're you're on the front line. 80 kilometers that way is the First Guards Tank Army, and they want to come this way through my home. I live next to a <laughs> nuclear, uh, you know, the, the, a nuclear storage facility where if the war went up, that would be the first place hit, and we knew it. Uh, so growing up, I literally lived next door to one of the first targets to be hit by a nuclear weapon, and you went to school every day saying, gee, I wonder if we're going to come home. And it wasn't facetious, especially when your father disappears in the bunker, as he did every now and then, because things would happen. And uh, and then he would go into the bunker and uh, he had the, there was a, a movie or a book written back then called Alas, uh, Alas Babylon. Uh, Ray, you might be familiar with it. It's a story about an Air Force officer who, that was the code word he would send off to his wife if the nuclear weapons are going to fly. Basically call home and say, Alas Babylon. It means the world is going to end. And that was the code word that my parents had. So if my dad was down in the bunker and he could get a call out, it would be a last Babylon. And that meant, baby, um, <laughs> bring the kids together, cook a nice meal and hold hands because it's all going to come to an end. That was my reality. So I joined the military to fight that. I was a true believer. I joined to kill commies. When they say kill a commie for mommy, I'm a kill a commie for mommy kind of guy. When they say better dead than red, you're damn right. I'll kill every commie before I, before I surrender. Um, and I joined the Marine Corps to do just that. Uh, you know, Marine Corps taught me about integrity, straight up integrity. Um, it, you know, the first thing I, they said in the intelligence school was, if you lie, Marines die. Never lie. Your job isn't to tell what your boss wants to hear. Your job is to tell them what the facts are, and then they get to make decisions based upon that. But if your boss is putting pressure on you to change something, you tell the boss to back off. That's not his job. His job is to sit down, shut up, and let you say, speak, and then he can make the decisions. And the beauty thing about the Marine Corps is they literally preached and they practiced what they preached so that when it came time for me to speak, everybody shut up and they listened. 
you spoke and then they'd ask questions and then they'd kick you out and make their decisions because that's what they do. You give course A, course B, course C. They're the ones that get to make that decision. When they sent me to uh, to Russia, to the Soviet Union to do to implement this arms control treaty, um, at that time, the Defense Intelligence Agency was saying that the Soviets were cheating, that they had held on to around 300 um, SS-20 missiles. And the way they could justify that is they had an expanded view of how many SS-20 missiles were produced at the Botkin factory that we were inspecting. So in comes, I was going to use a bad word, dingbat Ritter, stupid lieutenant. I mean, there's nothing dumber in the military than the lieutenant. So here comes this lieutenant, and they put me outside this factory, and I'm dumb enough to think that my job is actually to figure things out because there is no book. It's, you know, there's nobody sitting there saying, this is how we do it, this is what you want to do. You sat down and you went, what am I supposed to do? Think about it. So I'd walk around the factory. I'd listen to train uh, tra train signals. I'd listen to train movements. I'd track things going in and out. And I quickly figured out that the, they can produce about 60 missiles a year, 80 max. So I wrote a paper about that. The CIA went, wow, good stuff. The DIA went, no, you don't get to say that. You're a lieutenant. And they brought me in. They put a general in front of me. That's supposed to intimidate a lieutenant, but he was an Air Force general. And then they put a whole bunch of colonels out there, and they all sat there and said, hey, uh, lieutenant, uh, you got to change your paper. And I said, why? Why do you want me to change your paper? Because it's hurting our budget. You see, we need 200 missiles to justify the billion-dollar budget we put in there to do things. And if you're coming in saying 60, 80, that means they're complying. We lose our budget. And I said, that's your problem, not my problem. They said, yeah, but I'm a general. And I said, yeah, but I'm a Marine. Stick it in your ear. Get the hell out of here. If you got a problem with me, go to headquarters Marine Corps, <laughs> tell the commandant, bring it down to my chain of command, and they'll tell me to do something. But I'm not listening to you. And the Marine Corps backed me up. That was the beauty of it. The Marine Corps went, that's what you're supposed to do, pal. That's what you're supposed to do. We got to the Gulf War. You know, I'm in General Schwarzkopf's staff. Right off the bat, pew, pew, pew. Patriots are shooting down missiles. Now I'm the Scud guy. So I go look at the Scuds, and I go, this was never hit by a Patriot. It patriots aren't hitting anything. You're not allowed to say that. Well, I wrote that paper up that that quickly got <laughs> shredded someplace. Then they're saying, you know, we knew they had 19 mobile launchers. Two weeks in, we've killed 64 mobile launchers. I went, I'm a stupid Marine. I'm not very good at math, but I can tell you that if you only got 19, you can't kill 64. So we got a problem here. So I quickly started to investigate and, and I, I came up and I said, we're not killing any. The Air Force isn't killing anything. Delta Force isn't killing anything. The SAS isn't killing anything. Nobody's killing anything. And I was I was fired, actually. I was fired by General Schwarzkopf because he didn't want to hear this. Uh, Colin Powell stood, stood up for me. Colin Powell came in and said, no, Ritter's on one case. Right. I got my job back. I finished the war. Got a medal. Yay. All that stuff. But what I learned is you don't back down. You tell the truth. Tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Then I get to Iraq. And what I learned in Iraq is I was the most naive person ever to walk the face of the earth because I actually believed that my job was to disarm Iraq. I actually believed it. And I did it. I went in there. I spent seven years doing this job. And I found out that the CIA, they, you know, I was dealing with the analysts, people like Ray, who were actually honorable. There was this whole other group called the special activities staff. And they do things, you know, paramilitary operations. They do regime change. And their job was to get rid of Saddam Hussein. And disarmament got in the way of their job. They used me to spy on Saddam. They didn't want me to disarm Saddam because then sanctions would be lifted from Saddam. And they lied, they lied, they lied. You know, this this all comes to Richard Haas. Ray, you might know him, the old uh, head of policy planning for the State Department during the lead up to the Gulf War. He just wrote a uh, an article where he said, everybody's accusing us of lying, but lying requires intent. We just got it wrong. And I'm like, Richard, you lying sack of manure. Um, you didn't get it wrong. You knew the truth. How do I know they know the truth? And this is where people don't understand. For seven years, I ran the intelligence for the United Nations on Iraq weapon mass destruction. I liaised with the CIA, the DIA, the NSA, GCHQ, British Defense Intelligence, MI6, Mossad, Amman, uh, German intelligence, the world. Basically, anybody who dealt with I Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, I was the guy they went to. And after a while, you basically stop. They stop being able to supply you with intelligence and you become the source of intelligence. Because why? They give me things. I go into Iraq. I investigate. I come back. I share it with them. They think about it. We come back. And after a while, they're waiting for me because they got nothing left to give. 
So I'm coming in and I'm saying, this is what I saw. This is what we're doing. They'd assess and they say, well, maybe you want to do X, Y, and Z. I'd say, well, I'll do X, but not Y and Z. Go in. And suddenly I am, not just me, but the other inspectors, we are the sole source of meaningful intelligence about Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. And we're briefing this to everybody. And when we left, the CIA has now acknowledged when we left, they had nothing, literally nothing, no sources, nothing. They were flying blind. So when Colin Powell and everybody else is up there saying, we know this, that, and the other thing. And I said, no, I wasn't guessing, ladies and gentlemen. I was telling the damn truth because I did the job. They didn't have anything. They were making it up. And they lied, and we went to war, and now they're claiming it was a mistake. And this was one of those educational moments in my life. You know, I got a lot of people, I see it in your little chat room, people saying, I'm not an American patriot. First of all, say that to my face, and I'll kill you. Um, I'm the most patriotic person you'll ever meet in your life. And I'm not a pacifist. I believe in violence. I'm actually pretty good at it. I'm getting a little older, but don't worry about it. I can handle myself. So call me a traitor to my face. Pay the price. That's just a standard offer for anybody out there. I shouldn't be reading your stuff, but I do. Um, <laughs> but what I learned there is, uh, is, is that the United States government lies. Lies. That's all they do. They lie. They don't know how to tell the truth. And then what I did, because once you break that code, it becomes very easy. Because everything becomes like now, you know, every time David Petraeus stood before Congress and talked about Afghanistan, he lied. Every time a general goes before Congress and talks about anything, they lie. And now you go back in history and you realize there's people like Daniel Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers. People today don't understand what the hell happened there. Daniel Ellsberg exposed one of the biggest lies ever. Seymour Hirsch, people today know him for the Nord Stream 2. My lie massacre. It was all a lie. Everything's a lie. We can't tell the truth. There's nothing we do. I challenge anybody right now. Tell me something besides the Apollo moon mission. But even then we lie because we don't like to talk about the role play by the Nazis and getting us there. But you know, other than that, I'm not going to go in conspiracy that we didn't really land on the moon. I think we did. We did that well. But when it comes to national security, find me one thing we told the truth on. And that's just an open challenge to anybody right here. One thing we've told the truth on as a country, and you can't. I broke the code. All we do is lie. We lie about everything because the truth is inconvenient. The truth doesn't mesh with the, the unnatural thing that America is. You see, we promote something called the rules-based international order. That's the most unnatural thing for the world out there because rules-based means America-based. The rest of the world doesn't necessarily want it. They want what they all agreed upon, the law-based international order set forth by the Charter of the United Nations. You know, the Charter, it's a treaty. We signed it. The Constitution says when we sign something, it becomes the law of the land. But we violate the Charter all the time in deference to the rules-based international order that has no legal framework, no legal justification whatsoever, and only exists to promote American hegemony. And so to promote American hegemony, it's like, Oh, Mary Poppins, a spoon's full of sugar, lets the medicine go down. We're trying to shove medicine down everybody's throat. And the medicine is take it or leave it where America, our way or the highway. And the world's finally waking up and saying, we, we prefer the highway. And your way is that way. Get the hell away from us. And it, the world's woken up. They've come to the same awakening that I have, that the country that I love, that I was prepared to die for, and I'm still prepared to die for. Because you see, as bad as America is right now, I still believe in the promise of America. I still believe in the basic premise of the Constitution, the rule of law. Even though there is no viable justice system today, it's as corrupt as the day is long. We could fix it. We can fix it. We stand for something good, but we've become something so far removed from that which we proclaim to be that it's unrecognizable. Uh, but I'd like us to become that country. I'd like us to be that place, but we're not. And as long as we pretend we are, then we got a problem because you cannot solve a problem unless you first accurately define the problem. And if you're walking around today saying America's good, a force for good, we're here to do good in the world, you have not defined the problem because America is bad. We're a force for evil and we only do bad things in the world. We're a friend to no one. We're a friend to no one. Ask the South Vietnamese, ask the Kurds, ask the Iraqis, ask the Afghanis, ask the Ukrainians how good of friends we are. Hey, Georgia out there, my wife's from Georgia, I have to throw this message out for the Georgians. We're not your friends either. We'll sell you down the road. We'll sell everybody down the road because we only care about ourselves. We only care about the accumulation of American power. 
and I know I just babbled on, but damn it, Ray, you pulled a string and you got me going. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's what happens when a Marine meets a veteran of the company. So I very much invite this lively discussion. Gentlemen, literally, you know, no, go Scott ahead, Ray. Was a, uh, uh, Scott is not the kind of guy that wants to intimidate me, even though he was a captain and a major, and I graduated, so to speak, as a as an infantry intelligence captain. But I want to ask, I want to take this uh, opportunity to ask my friend Scott a question. Uh, I never had a chance to do this. It's relevant. Uh, when Colin Powell wrote his voluminous memoir, a lot of it had to do with the first Iraq war. And the subject of SCUDs came into the equation. And at one point, uh, Schwarzkopf, bragged before the the world that ah, we had just destroyed four uh, scud missiles just lying around there now in the book paul admits that was it mcconnell was he his intelligence McConnell guy yeah. yeah mcconnell is the admiral okay navy <laughs> scott and i have a bond i'm not a marine but i'm an army infantry guy okay so mcconnell goes to uh, Schwarzkopf and he says, uh, uh, General, I, I don't know how to say this, but uh, there's this DIA analyst that says, those weren't scuds. They were oil tankers, for God's sake. Schwarzkopf calls up Powell and says, Powell, what the hell are you doing undercutting the generals running this damn war? They were scuds. <laughs> no, of course they were oil tankers. But do I have that right, Scott? Do you remember that little episode? Oh, look, that, what, if you read it, what what it is is um, McConnell comes to uh, Schwarzkopf and says, um, you know, he's out there saying that he killed scuds. Uh, <laughs> but then he said, but there's a problem. We got this report from one of from one of the guys on his staff that says they were oil tankers. And, and Powell first, he's like, come on. I mean, can't Schwark, why doesn't Schwarzkopf just talk to the analyst? And so they called him up and he called up Schwarzkopf and Schwarzkopf said, I did. He's not as good as the others. He sucks. He's bad. He's the bad analyst. Everybody else thinks they were scuds. He's the worst guy. Um, that was me he was talking about. I'm not <laughs> as good as the others. But then Powell and McConnell took the imagery, the video, and took it and enhanced it. And they were all exactly oil tankers. tankers but the thing is i got fired because are you the I, guy I, I, was the guy? Guy. <laughs> I was the guy i i literally looked at the videotape when it came in and i went <laughs> um oil tankers and then on my report number of confirmed scud kills zero that night zero. schwarzkopf goes on national tv and briefs it he brings in buster gloss and they show the videotape now i want to show you how we killed scud boom 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 and so he went seven seven confirmed kills so in the morning i submit my zero report and colonel thomas comes in and he goes hey, you got to change that number to seven i said no he said you got to change the number to seven i said no i'm the guy who gets to make that call not you not anybody else he said when the commander-in-chief goes on national tv and brief seven you, his staff is going to reflect seven and i said then you do it i'm not falsifying report i'm going on record right now that that is a lie a bald-faced lie he left, came back, you're fired, get out of here. But before I left, I took my report and I slipped it to a guy um, who was the DIA's uh, liaison there. Uh, and I gave it to him and I said, we got a problem here. And uh, he's the one who sent the report up to McConnell. And McConnell okay. looked at it and went, oh, wow. Oh, oh. And so Schwarzkopf confronted him. But the bottom line is they came back and they basically went, you know, and Schwarzkopf would not, wouldn't be the guy. He just, I don't care what you do. And so Thomas came out and he goes, you got your job back. He goes, but I'm just telling you, we changed the report. It's seven. Seven's the number. And that's staying at seven forever. And I went, as long as my name's not attached to that seven, I don't care. And from then on, <laughs> that number stayed at seven. It never increased because I was the battle damage assessment guy, and I knew we weren't killing any scuds. But, no, I was the guy that uh, Paul wrote about in his book, yeah. Well, that answers my question because I always wondered what happened to that poor guy who told the truth. And you were fired? But then you were reinstated. Well, it, but it, it's better than that because later on, I ended up going up to, uh, well, I mean, long story short, ended up going up and working with uh, Delta Force. 
and uh, we were getting ready to do some stupid stuff. And um, uh -huh. I got arrested <laughs> because Schwarzkopf accused me of trying to start my own war. I went in and told Delta Force that they're searching for scuds in the wrong place. They need to be searching in this place. And they were getting ready to do some stuff. And the word got back and Schwarzkopf went, no, 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 no. It's, uh, it's February 22nd. We're starting the ground war in two days. We're not playing any of this nonsense. We're not going to start a conflict in Western Iraq looking for scuds. We're about to win the war right now. And then they said, well, he said, well, who's doing all this? And they said, Ritter. And he went, arrest them. <laughs> and they arrested me and brought me back. And I had to appear before Brigadier General Neal, who accused me of, you know, violating direct orders and all this kind of stuff. And um, and I confronted him with the fact that I was actually obeying his orders and showed him the documentation to prove it. And uh, he, he tore up the arrest warrant and they sent me back. And like I said, they gave me a medal. But I was fired twice, arrested once, all by General Schwarzkopf in that war <laughs> you heard it here for the first time i think ladies and gentlemen so it just goes to show the quality of guests that we have but the scott i think because i know you're writing your next book on the uh scud hunt i think you have an app title right there for the book the bad analyst the bad <laughs> analyst basically <laughs> that i would add the chapter but uh <laughs> yeah or, or the badass analyst for example but perfect title wow uh, uh, that was really cool I, I love the back and forth uh really fantastic gentlemen literally one last question there's a breed of so-called analysts in Poland who don't have a background in intelligence, who don't have a background in military art. A lot of these people come from the political science field. A lot of these people are lawyers. Now, I have a friend of mine whose name is Dr. Leszek Sokulski. Dr. Sokulski, how you doing? Who was just fired a few weeks ago for setting up the Polish anti-war movement from his college because, as the rector stated, his actions are not in line with the Polish national interest. So not bringing Poland to a war is apparently not in line with the Polish national interest. But Dr. Sikulski is kicking ass out there. He's still moving forward with the Polish anti-war movement. God bless him. But I think it was he who once told me that never trust lawyers who talk about geopolitics. And I just want to get your final insight about what it takes, what people should look for in a person who's commenting on matters of intelligence, I'll ask that to Ray and matters of military art that'll go to Scott. So Ray, uh, in terms of intelligence experience, should we be listening to lawyers or majors in art or political scientists? Uh, you shouldn't be listening to lawyers. You shouldn't be listening to political scientists. You should be listening to historians. Even historians whose purview is just the last couple of decades and preferably historians who have served in the military. And one problem we have, of course, is uh, Jacob Sullivan and Tony Blinken never served in, well, I made a mistake, it just pointed out to me. I wrote an article saying they had never served in the US military. Uh, the comment was, you ought to strike out US there because we have information that they may have served in the Israeli military. Whoa, I don't know if that's true or not, but the military thing is what's important. You have to have a modicum, a modicum of, of experience to, to know that these generals aren't worth their salt, that if they don't look at lines of supply and if they look at ammo and ability to field an army, I mean, what the hell good are they except to uh, go through the revolving door, work for Raytheon again and become double millionaires? So, yeah, don't listen to anybody except colleagues that you respect and your training shouldn't involve history more than political science. You're not trying to jigger the system here. You're trying to figure out what works and what history has shown. And uh, your language your capabilities are important. But most of all, uh, to thine own self be true. And thou they, then thou canst not be false to anyone. Scott, should we take people with lawyer with uh, law degrees or political science degrees as enough of a pedigree to comment on the art of war? Well, uh, here's my thing. Uh, resumes are important. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Experience means means an awful lot, um, but it doesn't mean everything. Look at all the generals and colonels that are on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News right now talking about the war in Ukraine. They're just dead on wrong, dead on wrong. Because they're using their rank, they're using their title, they're using a, 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 um, a resume to sell you a bill of goods. Um, 
they're not genuine analysts. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with a law degree. I I have a lot of respect for lawyer. My sister's a lawyer. Um, the most unexpected thing in the world. If you knew my sister when she was a kid, and now you think that she's a lawyer, like whoa, the world ended. I'm very proud of her. She was she's the the top notch. But her brain, the way a lawyer's brain work is the way it's supposed to work, is that you have to go and do the research. You have to test things uh, that you don't answer questions until you know the answer, uh, you know, and, and things of that age. It's what's supposed to work. There's a lot of bad lawyers out there, but and there's a lot of bad generals out there. I don't think you should accept a fate. For instance, you know, I'll just tell you myself, you know, I spent two and a half years in artillery battalion. So when I speak about artillery, I know something about it. Um, I designed a core sized amphibious uh, operation uh, that was briefed to the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And I was questioned by four star generals, three star generals, two star generals, one star generals, colonels about every aspect of this down to the last little logistical thing. So I know <laughs> everything it takes to put a core across the beach in terms of sustainability, supply lines, how we're going to do this, not just fighting on the ground, but projecting where you want to be, how much stuff you're going to need, all that. Uh, I, I did that. Um, I, I did the whole uh, the breach planning for the Marine Corps assault through the 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 the, the, the I think for the I forget the name of the oil fields that we had to go through the but I, I designed the Iraqi defenses I populated it I did this Janus computer game where we had to input everything and I learned about it but when I say I I keep saying I I I I I it was a team I had people talking to me teaching me educating me the whole step of the way and I earned it I learned an awful lot. But when it comes to Ukraine, if I came in there and I just said, because I did everything I just told you I did, you must accept at face value everything I'm telling you about Ukraine, you should just turn me off and fire me. Boom, done. Why? Because I don't know anything about Ukraine. Everything I just did is about that unique experience. I learned some things. I learned some patterns. I learned how to evaluate and analyze. But if I don't apply that to, to Ukraine, and here's the problem about Ukraine. Who the hell knows? Excuse my language. I mean, we're sitting here, I'm sitting here thousands of miles removed from it. I am a prisoner of sources. And these sources are open sources. I don't have, you know, I can't pick up the phone and call anybody. And if they talk to me, we both go to jail. Um, and I don't want that. So I'm assessing things. So the first thing I have to do when I, when I talk today is I say, I don't know. I literally don't know. Now, you want my assessment? I'll give you my assessment. And then I can explain to you the methodology I use to come up with it. But even now... You say, okay, well, Scott Ritter's a military expert. We should listen to what he says. Sort of listen to what I say, but don't accept it. I mean, I, I see all down here. I'm a, I'm a Kremlin troll, a Kremlin shill, a Kremlin agent. Hey, guys, view me as that. Really, I'm serious. And I said this going into Iraq, too. Every time I said there's no WMD, don't take me for view me that Saddam Hussein's paying my salary. And I'm here right now telling you this. Why do I want to say that? So you challenge everything I say. So you literally challenge everything I say. You assume I'm lying to you, and it's your job to prove me wrong. I want you to go on that journey, the journey of proving Scott Ritter wrong. And here's what's going to happen. You're either going to find the evidence that I'm just bat, you know what, crazy, or you're going to say, gosh, he was right there. He was right there. He was right. Maybe Scott Ritter's right. But now what? It's not. You're not saying Scott Ritter's right because I told you to say I was right. You're saying Scott Ritter's right because you have made that determination like a lawyer like a lawyer would. So I have no problem with lawyers who go through the process, who do the job, who do the due diligence, even though they don't have a military background and they check it out, they cross the T's, they dot the I's and they come to a conclusion. I'll buy into that conclusion because I trust the process. I really don't like what I call, and I don't mean to irritate people, or I'm probably going to, the vet bros. I was in the Ranger Battalion in Afghanistan. I was special forces in, uh, in in Iraq. I was a SEAL that did this. I was Delta Force that did that. And now we're going to tell you how large-scale ground combat in Europe works. Why? What about your resume tells you you can do any of that? You don't know anything about large-scale ground combat in Europe. And yet you gave me a resume that has no bearing on it. Now I'm supposed to believe you at face value. No, at least be humble enough to say you don't know anything about large-scale ground combat, but you do know a little bit about the military. And so you're going to try and work through the problem. See, if you work through the problem like a lawyer does, then you might come up with something that I can buy into. But if you're simply going to come in and say, I'm a vet, bro, I served, I got a special forces tattoo, and you're going to believe everything I tell you. No, I'm not. 
Just like if a lawyer comes in and says, I'm going to just straight off the bat tell you that about the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, all that. I'm going to be like, but you got to explain how you got there. I'm not going to just buy it because you say you're a lawyer because lawyers lie too much. So do generals. So do politicians. So do most people. It's the process that gets you to the conclusion that counts. And sometimes lawyers have a better mind to do that than other people. But no matter what, challenge it. At the end of the day, the, if you're going to say, I believe something, it can't be because somebody told you to believe it. It's because you did the hard work of checking the data, confirming the data, testing the data, and coming up with your own conclusion. So that one says, someone says, why do you believe it? You don't say, because I heard it from Scott Ritter. That's not an answer, ladies and gentlemen. I heard it from Ray McGovern. That might be a better answer because Ray's a better <laughs> <laughs> But If you're saying I heard it from somebody, that's wrong. What you got to say is, hey, I listened to Scott and Ray talk and I listened to this other person talk. Then I went and read some books and I did some homework. And, um, I, you know, I, this is what I believe. Boom. You know what you just became? An informed citizen. The most dangerous person in America. A citizen who thinks on their own. They're not a prisoner to mainstream media. They're not a prisoner to what the government says. They are empowered by what they have learned. Knowledge is power. Empower yourself with knowledge. And that's, again, I went on too long, Mike. I apologize. Well, that's all right. That, this was a epic discussion. And I hope that thanks to this discussion, we're going to contribute to a lot more, a hell of a lot more uh, informed citizens here and across the pond, because that's what we need in order to end this craziness. Gentlemen, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. This was a great discussion. A big dziękuję from all of us in Poland here. Uh, and I'm pretty sure to our international audience. Uh, thank you once again for your time. All the links to Ray's Twitter and Ray's website you can find in our description box as well as Scott Ritter Extra website and Scott's Twitter. Uh, also in the description box. Give them all a like. Give them all a follow. Thank you once again for commenting. Uh, to all the Ukrainian trolls, you can go, you know what, yourself. Uh, but to all the good people, to all the honest people, keep on coming back. Give us some subs. Give us some likes. That helps the channel very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Good day. God bless you all. And Ray and Scott, have a great day. And I hope to see you soon on Votem TV. Thank you once again. Thanks. Most welcome.